Hey there, once again, YouTube. Um, first off, I just want to let you guys know I do have a new page on my website. I deleted the download data page under the how to menu and replaced it with a new page called how to retrieve seismic data. And this is a much simpler. Now, for those out there who sometimes ask me for seismic data or don't know how to do it themselves because my page was a little confusing on it because I did talk a lot on that page. I stripped it down and basically just steps of how to do this seismic data retrieval for beginners. Seismometers of the world, 105,639 to be exact. Going down, I show you the steps and I do have uh, GIF animations on my website here so you can see an example. It's not really required, uh, but yeah, you can see an example of what happens with these steps just prior. And I do have some more steps here and some more steps here and go all the way down. I have a total of 13 steps of how to download seismic data. It's very easy when you get the hang of it, guys. Very, very easy. And then I do show you how to get seismic audio, which will allow you to hear seismic events, primarily seismic earthquake swarms and longer duration events, such as, again, seismic swarms or volcanic tremor. So you can check out this page if you want under the how-to menu on my website, Retrieve Seismic Data. Go check that out. I am still in the process of updating many different parts of my website when I do have the time. And I do know that up here it says click here to understand how to use the basics of the program Swarm. I have a link right there to my page under the how-to menu. I have not updated that page yet. It needs to be updated. So it's a little bit of an older version but it still should help you if you need that right away. But I will update that very soon. Now, let's talk about Steamboat Geyser just real quick. So, Steamboat Geyser, which was, which is the largest active geyser on the face of the world, uh, it resides at the Norris Geyser Basin within Yellowstone National Park. Now, we're going to go here to the temperature gauge for Steamboat Geyser. Now, I talked about this in my last video, one of my last videos. I will put a link to that video in the description box below if you want to go check that out now. You should. Talking about how Steamboat Geyser shows precursors prior to each eruption. And as we do see, and as I talked about, we did see for the eruption between the 19th and the 22nd of August, we did see precursors leading up. Boom, eruption. Then it goes back down to normal background temperatures and then goes back up again as activity and smaller eruptions increase, and boom, we see an eruption. Precursors, boom, eruption. So there is a pattern, and you can sort, you can't really predict exactly when it's going to be, but you can know when it's just right around the corner. And you can see right now, Steamboat Geyser are showing clear precursor signs of increased Steamboat eruptions, little teeny tiny ones. Not They can't be seen on the YNM seismograph. These are very, very minor eruptions, but still enough to increase the temperature of the water in the outflow channel. And uh, these, I use this as a precursor judge now. I judge when a steamboat eruption is about to occur, and it's getting very, very close. We should see another steamboat eruption. I'm going to guess. Now, this is just a guess. I'm probably going to be wrong. Now, right now, it's 7.56 p.m. Pacific Time, September 8th, 2019. I'm going to guess that it's going to erupt anywhere from 6 a.m. Mountain Time all the way to noon Mountain Time for September 9th. 2019, which would be tomorrow. That's when I'm guessing it will erupt next. That's what I believe. I'm probably going to be wrong. It could erupt a little bit later in the day, but right now I am guessing it will erupt again sometime in the morning to just barely noontime on the 9th, on September 9th, 2019. So we'll see if I'm right about that. Probably won't be. I might be a little bit off, but you know, it's interesting nonetheless that we do see precursors, which will allow you to know when a steamboat eruption is coming, a major one. And we do see we're near the end of the precursor activity for this one. So steamboat geysers should be erupting in the next day, definitely. Going to earthquakes, I want to talk about two earthquakes just real fast. Earthquake activity has been somewhat low on the west coast of the United States. Some moderate earthquakes striking in the Midwest right down here, especially one in New Mexico, which I found was very intriguing. Let's zoom into that one just quick. I have not looked at the actual location of this event. Now, New Mexico does see moderate earthquakes near the border between New Mexico and Colorado every now and then. But let's zoom in right here. I was thinking, is it Vals Caldera? No, no, nowhere near the Vals Caldera. Nowhere near Vals, Vals Caldera, a super volcano, is right in this location right down here. Yes, New Mexico does have a super volcano. Isn't that funny? 
But the two main quakes I wanted to focus on for today were two strange ones, guys. Two strange ones. Now, let's go all the way up. I'm going to first find this one, which is up here in the north, near the Canada Basin. There's a magnitude 4.1, supposedly at 10 kilometers in depth. Remember, when you see 10 kilometers in depth in a very strange location just off in the ocean, usually that means the depth is wrong, and they could not constrain the depth. Regardless, they say it's a 4.1 at 10 kilometers in depth, which struck at 1934 UTC on September 8, 2019. Of course, nobody felt this event at all, but we're going to just take a look at it from the closest seismic station available, which you can find if you go to the event page of any event, click origin, click phases, click arrival time. Okay, the closest one is BMAR in the IM network. Short period vertical SHZ, this time location code F0. Let's take a look at that in the seismic program swarm just real quick. And also, we're going to see some very low frequencies associated with this event, basically because the arrival time of the closest station is 167 seconds. I mean, obviously, when we go back and look at the location of this earthquake, it is very far away from the nearest seismic station because they really don't have any stations out here in the ocean at all. Maybe off the coast of Washington and Oregon, they do have um, ocean floor stations, but not out here in the Canada Basin in the Arctic Ocean. So, we will see some really low frequencies associated to this event. Let's take a look at it real quick, though. Okay, well, for some reason, it is showing the network IM right here, but there is no BMAR. So, I don't know how they were able to pick phases from BMAR, since there is none. But let's just take the second closest seismic station, cold in the AK network. I know that one will work. So, here we have seismic data from COLD in the AK, excuse me, AK network. Broadband vertical, no location code given. We're going to add a 1 hertz high pass filter since it's a broadband channel to filter out all those pesky background microseisms. Now we're going to scroll all the way down here. Now since again, this occurred at 1934 UTC, but it took about 172 seconds. So oh, about two and a half minutes, around two and a half minutes. So we should see it instead of 1934. We should see it at about 1936.30, around there, around there. So let's look at about 1936.30 and see if we can find it. 1936.30, where are you, my friend? 1936.30, 1936.30 is right about here, nothing. But we do see it is right here. So it was at about 1937 it arrived. A very strange looking event, but as we can see, dominant lower frequencies because it was far away from the station. But this is the magnitude 4.1 within Canada Bay, which is in the Arctic Ocean, actually near the North Pole. And why don't we go take a look at where exactly this event is located, not seeing really any aftershock activity for this 4.1, but it did strike in a very odd, very, very odd location. Uh, here's some other activity right here. Don't know if this is local activity or some more aftershocks in that location. Very possible the, uh, these are aftershocks in that magnitude 4.1 location, but let's take a quick look in Google Earth. Let's copy the location, shall we? Go take a look at the exact location of Google Earth. Here you are in Google Earth. Let's paste those coordinates just real quick and press search. Let's see what we find. Let's see the exact location of where this occurred. Man, it really is the North Pole, guys. That really is the North Pole. I don't know if you can get farther north than that, guys. My goodness. Now, I know the North, the North Magnetic Pole is shifting towards Siberia and Russia, I believe. But that almost is, look, right down there, North Pole would be kind of like right about there, the exact North Pole, right around that location. So very, very close, guys. Very strange location for any magnitude 4.1 to occur. I don't see any geological features in this area. I would expect some earthquakes every now and then up here where there are some fault zones, actually. You could tell there are some oceanic ridges and fault zones in the North Pole. But this is literally out in the middle of nowhere with no geological features whatsoever. So what caused this magnitude 4.1 in the North Pole? I have no clue. But let's move on to the next event. The next event I wanted to talk about was this earthquake right here. Surprised me, actually. A magnitude 5.5 in Africa and Tanzania. Again, supposedly at 10 kilometers in depth. They don't have that many seismic stations out in this location, I believe. So they probably were not able to constrain the depth on this. Let's look at the past seven days because I have noticed some events reported in this area for the past seven days. Notice we did have a good increase in seismicity around this location. We had a magnitude 5.0 in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And then we had a, excuse me, we had a magnitude 4.7. 
a little bit later. And then 4.6 up here in Uganda. And then a magnitude 4.6 down here in Zambia. Near Zambia. This was actually in Angola. So very, very strange earthquake activity in this location near Tanzania. And it basically culminated in a magnitude 5.5. Unless these are all four shocks to a larger event, which of course that is always possible. But I think it was culminating to this magnitude 5.5 in Tanzania. And we'll take a look at how many magnitude 5.5 earthquakes and larger have occurred in this area in the past two decades. We'll take a look at that in just a second. But this magnitude 5.5, five people reported feeling it, which is surprising. Because over in this area, people don't even know what USGS is. They'd be like, what is a USGS? Who knows what a USGS is over there? I mean, really, uh, that's very surprising. So these could have been possibly Americans or Europeans who are in, in this area. Or maybe there really are people in this area who know about USGS. But I'd be surprised that there are this many felt reports. So, uh, but yeah, magnitude 5.5, supposedly at 10 kilometers in depth, struck at 038 UTC, September 9th, 2019, which our time... That would be about 5.38 p.m. Pacific Time, September 8th, 2019. Remember, UTC is ahead of Pacific Time by about 7 hours or so. And let's go to Origin and see what the closest seismic station is to this event. Come on, buddy. Okay, arrival time. Let's see. Closest seismic, seismic station, excuse me, was pretty far away. Like I said, this area is very sparse with seismic stations. So I will try to get the data from MBAR in the II network. But first, let's take a look at the magnitude 5.5s for around this location for the past two decades. So I did extend it a little bit. This is since 1980. This is since January 1st, 1980 to right now. 8.13 p.m. Pacific Time, September 8, 2019. So that's almost four decades worth of seismicity. We see 44 earthquakes reported since 1980 on January 1st of magnitude 5.5 and above. The first reported would be in 1981 on November 18th. So going up, we do see the most recent magnitude 5.5. To find an earthquake similar to this, you'd have to go to this one right here, which was just to the southeast. And it was on... Uh, that's March 21st, 2019, again, a magnitude 5.5, and they were able to constrain the depth on this one to 22 kilometers, which is surprising. To find an earthquake larger, the most recent, you'd have to go to February 24th, 2017, a magnitude 5.9 struck just to the south-southwest or so of today's magnitude 5.5 in Tanzania. So this area is seismically active, guys. There are earthquakes that do pop off every now and then in this area. Now let's go to largest magnitude first. The largest would be this one right here, which was a magnitude 6.8 at 22 kilometers in depth on December 5th, 2005. That was the largest in the past four decades in this region. So definitely, again, very seismically active. Now let's take a look at the seismic data from the closest seismic station, which we will see some lower frequencies, guys, because the seismic station was about 84 seconds arrival time away from this event. Now that is not really a distance factor, but I'm just saying it took 84 seconds to arrive on that station. So we will see some lower frequencies associated with this event, especially since frequencies attenuate, meaning they shrink with distance. Here we have the most recent data stream downloaded from MBAR in the II network, broadband vertical, 10 location code. We're going to add a one hertz high pass filter just to remove those pesky background micro -seisms. Now, we did notice that there have been uh, some other earthquakes in this location recently, just as of the past 24 hours or so. We have seen multiple earthquakes, probably around the magnitude 4 range, or maybe not, not even magnitude 4, maybe magnitude 3, magnitude 3.5, and maybe some magnitude 2s as well. Looking forward, we do see that's not an event. That's weird. That's not an event either. Neither is that. Neither is that. Okay, so where's the 5.5? Here it is right down here, the magnitude 5.5 in Tanzania. And we do see some dominant lower frequencies, which is expected since it took about 84 seconds for this event to arrive on this station. A very interesting P and S wave arrivals though, guys. I mean, very, very strange. But then again, it was pretty far away from this seismic station in question. The Coda, the tail end of the earthquake lasted quite a while. And we did see a few aftershocks associated with this, likely in the magnitude 2 to magnitude 3.5 range. You can see we did have another aftershock right there. And another aftershock, I believe, right there. I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And that was just as of a few hours ago or so. And we did have a foreshock right here. If it is in the same location, 
which I believe it is. We did have a Force Shock, and then the Magnitude 5.5 right here. Yeah, there's the 5.5 in Tanzania, right there. All right, let's see if any other earthquakes occurred while I have been recording this, which, you know what, that happens a lot, and then I have to go back and make a second video if something major occurs, so I just like to cover all my bases. Not seeing too much in the United States, not too much. A little activity here and there, but looks like we just had a magnitude 4.5 at 252.8 kilometers in depth in Italy. Let's see if this is under Stromboli or Mount Etna. If not, I'll just move on. Let's go see where this was. Not really under Stromboli. Stromboli is just north of Etna or so. Let's see, Mount Etna would be right in this location right here. Stromboli is just up in this location. So the 4.5 at 252.8 kilometers in depth struck up towards the north. So who knows? Maybe it's connected to Stromboli. Maybe it's not. But Stromboli has definitely been seeing some large activity over the past few months. Kind of waxes and wanes. But who knows what's going to happen next with Stromboli. Hope you guys have a great day. Don't forget to check out my new how to download data page on under the how to menu. How to retrieve data for beginners. It is a much more simplified version of my older page. So if you got confused with my older page, try out this new one. I really made it as quick as possible. So I know some of you guys out there probably will like it. Should help some people learn just how quick and easy it is to gather seismic data and open it in any program you wish. My favorite program is the Seismic Program Swarm, which I suggest anybody to use. It's amazing. I will update that Swarm page uh, with some additional information and kind of streamline it make it a little bit easier to understand. I'm going to try to do that to a lot of pages on my website, but just bear with me because it might take a while. Again, Steamboat Geyser, according to the precursor activity, I'm guessing it will erupt sometime between about 6 a.m. to about noon mountain time on September 9th, 2019, which would be tomorrow morning to the noon time. Hope you guys have a great day. God bless, and I'll see you later.